Ranger in front of a greenhouse. All right, well, fantastic. We are live. So wherever you're viewing from today, we thank you for taking time out of your schedule to uh, hang out with us and join us for this virtual tour. Uh, and so we're here at Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site. Uh, my name is Nick Sacco, and my colleague David Newman is with me behind the camera right now. And uh, we're going to be giving you a tour today of U.S. Grant's St. Louis home, Whitehaven. So kind of funny that it's called Whitehaven, given the fact that it's painted green. Uh, green, just uh, the, the specific color is Paris green, just like the city in France. We'll talk a little bit more about the color later on in this tour. Uh, but for now, why don't we go ahead, we'll start walking up here, and we'll talk a little bit about this house as we make our way up. Now, Ulysses S. Grant, he was a man on the move. He lived in states all around the country, and he's not originally from St. Louis. But when Grant was president of the United States, he made a speech, and he said that St. Louis was one of the only places he ever felt a connection to and it was because of Whitehaven. So that's one of the reasons that the National Park Service is here taking care of this house today. There's really three reasons that we're here. The main one is that the part, our namesake is named after General Grant, so Ulysses S. Grant, famous Civil War general, 18th president of the United States. But a lot of folks don't know that he was also a farmer here in St. Louis prior to the Civil War. Uh, the Grant family all lived here together for about five years from 1854 to 1859. So this is just a couple years before the American Civil War when the Grant family were living together here at Whitehaven. Whitehaven was also the childhood home of Ulysses S. Grant's wife, Julia Dent Grant. So Julia grew up at this house and in the years before the Civil War, the Dent family owned Whitehaven. So that's kind of the second reason we're here. By law, we have to also talk about Julia and incorporate her experiences into the story of this house. And our third reason for being here is that this property was a slave plantation before the Civil War. And the Dent family, uh, at their peak in 1850, they owned upwards of 30 enslaved African Americans who labored on this property. So it's not just about Ulysses S. Grant, it's also about the Dent family and the enslaved laborers who lived here on this property in the years before the Civil War. And uh, just one more quick note, we're kind of small today. We have about 10 acres of the original property. David, if you maybe want to show everybody here. So we're not that big of a national park today, but when, General, when Grant was living here uh, as a farmer, the property was 850 acres. So uh, all these residential neighborhoods that you see around us today, this was all part of the farm when Grant lived here. And uh, some of you, particularly if you're in the St. Louis area, you might be familiar with Grant's Farm, the famous animal park managed by the Anheuser-Busch Brewing Company. Uh, their property is across the street from us. They have about 300 acres over there, uh, but that was all part of Whitehaven as well, hence the name Grant's Farm. So why don't we go ahead and we'll make our way inside. We're gonna do a room by room tour and show you throughout the house. And we also have some outbuildings in the back that we'll show you as well. So let's go ahead here. And as we're walking up, these two steps that we're taking to get up to the front porch, these are original to the house. These are the same steps General Grant took to uh, arrive to the front porch here. Limestone steps. And uh, we've reconstructed the front porch, but Ulysses, he actually proposed to Julia right here on the front porch of this house. Walking through a hallway into a room with white plaster walls and dark green woodwork, mannequins portraying General Ulysses S. Grant and Julia Bent Grant stand in the room. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start the uh, tour inside the parlor room of Whitehaven. And this is a good place to kind of talk about the basics of what life was like here in Whitehaven. Now, I mentioned that Ulysses S. Grant is not originally from St. Louis. He was born and raised in Ohio. He went to college at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and when he graduated from West Point, uh, his first assignment was a military post called Jefferson Barracks. That's about five miles south of us. And by pure coincidence, when Grant was a cadet at West Point, one of his best friends and a roommate during his last year at West Point was a gentleman named Frederick Dent, who is Julia Dent Grant's uh, uh, brother. So Fred, when he heard that Grant was going to be in St. Louis, he invited him to come out to his childhood home, Whitehaven. So Grant accepted that invitation. He came out here. He's meeting the various Dent family members. And this is where he met a young woman named Julia Dent. They fell in love. They began their relationship 
here at this home. So in the parlor room here, this is really the room where it really kind of started for Ulysses and Julia. Um, think about in your house today, you might have a living room at your house and kind of think about the furniture that might be in the room and what sort of things you do in that room. And uh, living rooms in our houses today is kind of a place to spend quality time with family, to tell stories, catch up with each other's lives. If we have friends that come to our houses, a lot of times we'll spend time in the living room. And that's the case here at Whitehaven as well. This would be the first room that you'd come in and spend time together. So Ulysses and Julia, there would have been furniture in this room. They would have been sitting together, really getting to know each other. And uh, today we would say they started dating back in Grant's day. Uh, they were starting their courtship of trying to figure out if they like each other or not, spending time together here in this room. And the, uh, the Dent family, they were fairly wealthy. Julia's father, who was also named Frederick Dent, he was a prosperous merchant. He had his own business in downtown St. Louis, and he was one of these guys that would try to make a buck on anything he could sell. He was involved in the fur trade, food, clothing, supplies for people moving further west. So the wealth that was accumulated from that business in downtown uh, explains how the Dents were able to acquire 850 acres and this Whitehaven property. And by the way, I should add to this house, it, it's more than 200 years old. It was built between the years 1812 and 1816. So uh, technically speaking, Whitehaven is older than the state of Missouri. Missouri did not become a state until 1821. Kind of interesting. Um, for the Dent family, they entertained a lot of guests, friends, and family members in the parlor room. For example, we know that uh, William Clark, some of you may have studied the Lewis and Clark expedition. Well, William Clark was friends with the Dents, and he came out here sometimes and spent time with the family here. Uh, James Longstreet, famous Confederate general. General Longstreet is actually a cousin of the Dent family, and he too was stationed at Jefferson Barracks with Grant and would come out here and spend time with his relatives here at Whitehaven. And uh, Thomas Hart Benton, Missouri's first senator, longtime serving senator uh, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the years before the Civil War, friends with Frederick Dent, Senator Benton would sometimes come out here and make his way here too as well. So for the Grant and Dent families, the parlor room is a space for quality time together as family and time to really spend together getting to know each other and family bonding, kinship and belonging. But that may not have been the case for the enslaved laborers. I mentioned that there were upwards of 30 enslaved African Americans that labored on this property in the years before the Civil War. And uh, it might be fair to ask, while the Dents and Grants consider Whitehaven their home, it might be fair to ask whether the enslaved laborers felt the same way. Some of the enslaved laborers of Whitehaven uh, are going to be cooking and cleaning in the main house. So Mary Robinson and Mary Henry are two of the enslaved women that we know about. Uh, they would have been in this room, cleaning in the parlor room here, serving drinks to the, uh, to the white families in this room. And Julia Dentgrain also talks about Old Bob. Old Bob was one of the uh, longtime enslaved laborers here at Whitehaven. Uh, the Dent family came from Maryland, and a lot of their enslaved laborers came from Virginia and Maryland. And so Old Bob, one of his jobs was to cut down firewood outside and keep all the fireplaces running in the main house and in the outbuildings in the back. Between the main house and the outbuildings, there are eight fireplaces that old Bob would have had to take care of throughout the main house here. And Julia recalled in her memoirs that old Bob would sometimes be careless and he would let the fire go out on his match or his pump and he have to go back out and start a new match in order to get the fireplace going. And in Julia's mind, old Bob was sometimes careless, but historians and interpreters today, we can see that for old Bob, that was an opportunity for him to get away from the Dent family and have some uh, personal space and some privacy uh, away from the main house here, using that as an excuse to get away from the main house. So um, for the enslaved laborers, this room is not a place of fun, family, and entertainment. It's a place of hard labor and forced enslavement. And we always have to remember that when we visit plantation homes like Whitehaven. Um, we should be careful not to romanticize life here at these plantations because for many of the people who lived here um, this is very difficult work for these people and we always have to remember that um, slavery is a reality here in the years before the Civil War and slavery is fundamental to the growth of the United States. Uh, the, in human, the investment, the monetary investment in slavery before the Civil War was greater than all the farms, factories, and railroads combined. 
And that's the case here in Whitehaven. They're not just buying farm tools. They're not just buying equipment to keep the house clean. They're investing in human, uh, enslaved humans as well. So it's important to remember that when we tour plantation homes like Whitehaven as well. And I'll add too that we don't know for certain, but the evidence suggests that enslaved laborers built Whitehaven as well. I want to mention just a couple things and then we'll move on to the next room. You may have noticed these mannequins over here. I want to talk about these real quickly. Uh, the one to the right here, this is a dress uh, that Julia Dent Grant, it's a reproduction kind of dress you would have worn during the Civil War. So it's a great example of a Victorian style dress. And uh, there's actually eight layers to this dress, so uh, no doubt would have been very uncomfortable. There was a uh, local Girl Scout group about maybe 20 years ago that actually created this dress and donated it to the park. But it's based on a picture of Julia from the Civil War that is, listed, that is shown on that um, little display right there. Um, in addition to Julia's red dress, we also have a reproduction of a uniform that General Grant would have worn at the beginning of the war, um, uh, beginning of the Civil War. Uh, when Grant left the Army in 1854, he left with the rank of captain. When the Civil War breaks out in 1861, he'll get back in at the rank of colonel. Uh, he is going to be in charge of the 21st Illinois Regiment in the uh, kind of in the immediate beginning of the war. And a few months into the war, Grant was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. So we can see that noted on uh, Grant's shoulder straps right here. He's got one star on his shoulder strap. Uh, towards the end of the war, in 1864, when President Lincoln appoints Grant to be in charge of the entire U.S. Army, Grant will be bumped up to a three-star general as Lieutenant General of the United States. And if you come visit us sometime, we have one of the shoulder straps from when Grant was a three-star general that's actually in the museum, the real thing from his uniform. So you have to come out and check that out sometime. And we sometimes get questions about this hat uh, that General Grant is wearing, and this is called a hardy hat. And sometimes kids might ask, well, why is the one part of the hat kind of folded up? And there's a reason for that. So with these hardy hats, so what you're doing, if you're a soldier, you're going to have a rifle uh, that you'll be marching with. So when you're marching with your troops, you're holding that rifle, but you don't want to bump that rifle on your hat and knock off your hat. So one way to alleviate that, you kind of push that flap up so you can march, and your rifle's not going to bump your hat off as you're marching down the line there. So that's why the hat is set up this way, but that is a hardy hat that Grant wore with his Brigadier General's uniform. Um, and some of you might be also wondering, too, about um, the lack of furniture here at Whitehaven as well. Um, we don't really have the luxury of some other historic homes like President Lincoln's uh, home in Springfield, Illinois, where they have about 90% of the original furniture. We don't have that luxury here. When Grant was president of the United States, uh, he had his furniture that was here at Whitehaven. They put it in storage in another house that used to be across the street of what is now Grant's farm across the way from us. And unfortunately, uh, when Grant was president, that house was destroyed by fire and most of the furniture got lost. There's also a few furniture pieces at the Grant's home in Galena, Illinois, that's managed by the state of Illinois today. So there's a couple pieces from the Whitehaven years in Illinois as well. So um, most of the time when we do these tours, we do a 10 minute introduction at the front of the house and then let people kind of walk through the home self-guided rather than doing room by room tours because we don't really have any original furniture. We do have some uh, exhibit panels that we kind of highlight in each of the rooms so people can kind of read and learn more of the story as they're walking through the house as well. So I know there might be some questions about the furniture. So that's kind of how we do the tours here though, a little bit differently. Why don't we go ahead and make our way into the dining room, the next room across the hall here. Walking into a room with intricate Victorian wallpaper, a large mirror, and a blonde colored server. A reproduction newspaper with drawings of an African American man, woman, and two girls lays on a small wooden table near the window. Okay, so you're visiting the Grant and Dent families. You're going to spend maybe 60, 90 minutes or so catching up with everybody, hanging out in the parlor room, but then eventually dinner is going to be served. It's going to be in this room. So if you can imagine at the time there had been a large dining room table in this room. And the Grants and Dents would sit together with their friends and family and they would break bread together and have all different sorts of conversations. Think about the kind of conversations you might have at your house today. Um, if you're a kid, you might talk about how your day at school went 
or maybe some kind of upcoming event that you're doing. Uh, under normal circumstances, you might be uh, going over to hang out at friends' houses, playing sports, music, stuff like that. But when you get a little bit older, you might start taking an interest in the world around you. You might start following the news, following current events, following what we adults call politics. And uh, it's safe to say that we adults, we don't always get along with each other when we talk about politics because ultimately, when we talk about politics, we all have kind of different visions of what we want our country to look like moving forward. And sometimes we disagree about different issues. And uh, that was the case in Grant's day as well. When he's living here on the farm in the 1850s, the United States is going through a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of uncertainty about the future of the country. And Grant and his father-in-law, Frederick Dent, we know that they're both avid readers. They like to read newspapers and pay attention to what's going on in the news. And they would have lots of conversations at the dinner time uh, about various political issues. So for example, uh, they talked about the nature of citizenship. Who gets to be a U.S. citizen? What sort of rights do you get as an American citizen? They would talk about westward expansion. Um, during this time, sort of the spirit of manifest destiny. We have Native American tribes that are living out in the West, but there's this thirst for land and wealth further west. So settlers are making their way further out west. There's new states that are being formed, and there's questions about what these new western states are going to look like. So uh, Kansas, it becomes a territory in 1854, same year Grant moves here to St. Louis. Is Kansas going to be a free state? Or a slave state. Uh, and of course, discussions about the institution of slavery itself. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And it might be good just to briefly define what slavery is for our younger audiences. And the way I would define it is that slavery is essentially one human owning another human as property. Same way you may own a car or a house today. Of course, slavery is no longer allowed. It was banned through a change we made to our Constitution after the Civil War, the 13th Amendment, banning slavery in the United States. But before the Civil War, some states allowed for slavery, including Missouri. So Grant and his father-in-law would have these conversations about the future of the country, and they didn't always get along with each other. Um, one of the topics they would have been talking about was the Dred Scott decision. I'll have David kind of pan over here to this newspaper. Um, this is a reproduction of a newspaper that was published in 1857 about the Dred Scott case. So Dred Scott and his wife Harriet and their two daughters, they were enslaved here in St. Louis. And Dred Scott sued for his freedom at uh, the St. Louis Courthouse, what we call the old, old courthouse today, across from the Gateway Arch in downtown St. Louis. And Dred Scott's case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Taney, he issued an opinion that was extremely controversial. He argued that African Americans, whether they were free or enslaved, were not entitled to the right of citizenship. The way Taney framed it, he said that uh, African Americans were not, were, they had no rights by which the white man was bound to respect. And he also argued that slavery could not be banned by Congress or by any territorial legislature in any of these new states in the West. So it's extremely controversial because Taney is essentially arguing for the rights of slaveholders over uh, the rights of Congress and over the rights of the local states themselves to determine whether or not they wanted slavery. So this hugely important case started only 12 miles away from us in downtown St. Louis and no doubt Grant and his father-in-law are going to be talking about this Dred Scott case at the dining room table here. Um, so they're going to be talking about things like that. They're also talking about the nature of potential civil war as well. Grant's father-in-law, Frederick Dent, he's a, he's a very uh, strongly pro-slavery thinker. He did tell Grant at the beginning of the Civil War he didn't want to see the Union broken up. But Frederick Dent also argued he said that if, uh, if a state wanted to leave the Union, let them go. So if Mississippi or Alabama wanted to leave the Union in Frederick Dent's mind, let them go. Grant strongly disagreed with this. He argued that his father-in-law was supportive of the Confederacy, and uh, Grant, being a strong unionist, he finds any sort of compromise on the question of uh, disunion is unacceptable. As he framed it in his memoirs, Grant said that uh, the thought of disunion and talking about disunion as if it was a tariff bill uh, made his blood run cold. So to be a fly on the wall and to listen to some of these conversations that would have been taking place here in the dining room in the 1850s, right before the Civil War. 
I want to mention one more thing in this room, and that is the wallpaper. Uh, the National Park Service, we've been here, uh, the legislation was passed by Congress and signed by the late George Bush in 1989. So we're in our 30th year right now. And um, when we were doing early research in the 90s to learn more about Whitehaven, there was a large chunk of the original wallpaper that was still on the wall in the dining room. And we had enough of a sample that we were able to replicate it. So this is the actual Victorian style design of wallpaper that would have been in the dining room at the time that Grant uh, lives here and owns the property. Um, there's no doubt that the other rooms probably would have had uh, wallpaper as well, but this is the only one that we can verify 100%. But it's a neat sample and a representation of the Victorian style of design that was very popular in the mid to late 1800s as well. So um, why don't we go ahead and uh, I'm going to pass it over to Ranger Dave and he's going to take us through the next couple rooms here. Second Ranger walks into frame. <clears throat> okay, so we are going to uh, make our way up into the sitting room. So right this way, we're going to make one step up. In Victorian homes, oftentimes a step up or even a set of stairs might have signified that you were leaving what was traditionally kind of a public space or a gathering place for guests and company, and you're entering a space used primarily by the family members. As we make our way into the sitting room, I always point out to visitors that here on your right hand side, uh, you will notice a, a pretty um, grimy door today. Uh, this door would have served as the original slave entrance to the home. Uh, people like Mary Robinson and Mary Henry, who worked in the main house, would have been forced to walk through this door on a daily basis. And of course, this was exclusively used by the slave laborers here at Whitehaven, the enslaved African Americans who lived here on the farm. Uh, they were not allowed to use the front door or the back door like members of the Dent or Grant family. And you know, walking through this door on a daily basis, that would have served as a constant reminder of their status as enslaved people. So pretty interesting door. This was actually covered, as you may be able to tell, at one time with a false wall and discovered later on in the 1990s by the National Park Service. And you see exactly here what we discovered about 1994. Uh, coming up, we're actually going to see this door from the other side and uh, we'll get to see a little bit of the original Paris screen paint as well. So we'll be looking at that again shortly. As we make our way into the dining room, I will point out that this was very much a family space. Uh, many of you may have family rooms or living rooms at home today. Oftentimes I ask kids when they come here on school tours, do you have another name for the room? Sometimes they call them the great room or the game room where they get together and play with their brothers and sisters. Whatever you call it, this space the Grants called the sitting room, was very much a family gathering space. Uh, Ulysses and Julia might sit down with their children in here as they played games on the floor. Um, children in the 19th century played games that some of us may be familiar with today. Uh, they certainly played games like cards, and uh, looking in the cabinet down here, you can see a few examples of the types of games that they may have played. There are some playing cards in the bottom, uh, as well as some dominoes. Um, I know I grew up uh, setting up and knocking over do do dominoes as a kid. Uh, there's also games like ring toss and uh, you know oftentimes boys would play with games uh, and uh, even toys like the lead soldiers uh, which Nick if you pan over here we can see some lead soldiers in this cabinet. Um, of course that was traditional for boys because many were expected to at some times enter into a military uh, service. Uh, girls oftentimes played with dolls uh, like the porcelain doll you see there at the bottom of the case. Uh, we know though that one of the, the Grant's favorite games uh, was the game of checkers and Ulysses Grant actually writes about the fact that he loves spending time with his children and especially teaching them the, them the game of checkers. So when you visit the Grant home today you're going to see a period checkerboard set up to kind of represent what life was like here in the home for the Grant family when they're living here on the estate in this six year period before the American Civil War. And of course, Grant being a general and a military leader certainly had a knack for strategy games. Uh, games like checkers would have been one of his favorites, I'm sure, as well. Something he wanted to impart on his children. So not only is the family playing games in this room, they are also using this as a space to relax. Uh, they call it the sitting room for a reason. As you can imagine, people did a lot of sitting and relaxing in this space uh, on settees like the one you see over here in the corner, sometimes called a love seat today. Uh, but you can imagine this room full of plush furnishings where the family could really kick back 
and relax. And as they're relaxing, they might be reading letters from loved ones far away. Uh, we know that Ulysses spent quite a bit of time away from his wife and children. Uh, and uh, during these uh, times, uh, Julia was often living here at Whitehaven with her own parents. And he would send letters to this home, and uh, they would correspond from places like the sitting room here. Uh, not only would they share letters with each other, but they would also share things like photographs. And you have to remember, at the time when Grant was initially stationed on the West Coast, we're talking years before the American Civil War in the early 1850s, photography was still a new art form. It was a brand new science. The technology behind photography had really just been invented just years before. But that didn't keep the Grant family from sharing photos um, among one another during this time of separation. And Nick, if you pan over here, we can actually see a couple of the uh, photos here on the bookcase. The photo here on the far left, I always like to point out to my visitors. Uh, this is one of the earliest pictures of the Grant children. Uh, we can see uh, posed with the Grant children is Julia. Um, and right here we've got uh, Ulysses S. Grant Jr. That's Grant's second born. And right over here, uh, the older Frederick Grant, uh, which was Grant's first born son. And uh, to most visitors who visit the Whitehaven home, I call this the picture that brought Grant home. Uh, we know that Grant was sent out to the West Coast, and uh, uh, in 1852, Julia continued living here on the property while Grant was stationed at Fort Vancouver. Uh, and uh, Grant didn't mind life at Fort Vancouver. He actually thought the surroundings quite beautiful. He did have plans to move his family out to the West Coast at one point and uh, bring them along uh, with his military career, uh, but he thought it too dangerous to bring them when he initially moved to the West Coast. He thought perhaps he would only be on the coast for a matter of months. Uh, that ended up being a period of almost two and a half years. Uh, and as it would happen, just two weeks after Grant departed for the West Coast, Ulysses Jr. here was born in his absence. And so for almost two and a half years, Grant faces isolation and separation from his loved ones. And you can imagine for somebody like Grant who loved his family more than anything else in his life, how difficult it is to be away from your wife and children, especially a son who he'd never even met at this point in time. So a couple of years later, two and a half years later, Grant is now stationed at Fort Humboldt and he writes Julia a letter and he says, Julia enclosed in this letter are funds to have a photograph taken at the studio in St. Louis. There was only one studio in St. Louis at the time, but Julia does go to that studio. She has this picture taken with the two young children. She sent it out to Grant, hoping that it would quell his loneliness. If anything, it did just the opposite. Uh, Grant receives the photo, he sees for the very first time his little boy Ulysses S. Grant Jr. Uh, it is said that Julia not only had sent this picture along, uh, but she had also traced Ulysses Jr.'s handprint on the back of her letter. And uh, Grant remarked that his hand was already quite large for a boy his age. So you can kind of see the wheels are turning. Grant is struggling with this idea of being dedicated to this, this nation that he's helped to preserve as a soldier, and of course his duty to family back in St. Louis. And of course, ultimately, less than about a month after receiving this photo from Julia, Grant resigns his commission from the military um, and makes his way back to St. Louis, in part due to his friend Simon Buckner, uh, who helped pay his way back to St. Louis. And fun fact, Buckner and Grant would actually see each other again on the battlefield at Fort Donaldson, uh, when Buckner would ask Grant what terms of surrender he would give if Buckner, now a Confederate, gave up his stronghold at Fort Donaldson, Grant famously replied, no terms but complete and unconditional surrender will be accepted. So kind of a side note, Grant's friend Buckner who helped pay his way home also ended up facing him uh, as an enemy on the battlefield later in life. Uh, if you uh, turn to this next picture here in the center of the bookcase, we can actually see a photo of Julia and her father. That is Mr. Dent, the man who owns this farm, sometimes referred to as Colonel Dent. Uh, Colonel Dent actually appointed himself a colonel uh, by, uh, by the Southern standards, we could say. Um, Dent uh, was never a military colonel per se, uh, but as the head of a what he considered large plantation here in St. Louis, I started calling himself Colonel Dent, and this would have been considered a 
sign of respect uh, for a so-called southern gentleman. But that's Julia's father. And this picture was taken sometime around the beginning of Grant's presidency. You can see Julia wearing a dress similar to the one she was wearing in the other room. Mr. Dent posed. And of course, these are their two younger children. That's Nellie there between Julia and her father, their only daughter who ultimately ended up getting married in the White House and having one of the uh, great social events of the year during Grant's presidency. And then, of course, right here uh, with his hand on grandfather's soldier, uh, shoulder is uh, young Jesse Grant, uh, Grant's uh, fourth and final child. So uh, these are all pictures of the family, uh, Julia and the kids. Uh, many people look at this picture of Julia, if you can pan back over here for just a moment. One thing people often notice is uh, her eyes. Um, often people will ask us here at the Grant site, did Julia have crossed eyes? In reality, what she had was a condition called strabismus. Uh, this is something that uh, caused one eye to be what we might call lazy. It would kind of wander from one place to the next, and it might look, make her look cross-eyed. And uh, later in life, as Grant and Julia uh, by default become famous, uh, she come, becomes very self-conscious about this, uh, this eye condition. Apparently, it didn't affect her eyesight. Uh, she could still see fine, but she was self-conscious about the aesthetic, the, the look of that eye. And uh, anytime she had a public photo taken, uh, as you'll see with this other picture to the right, um, she always posed in profile. And uh, during the American Civil War, she was actually approached by a surgeon uh, who promised that he could effectively correct this condition that she had and uh, would even do it free of charge because she was the general's wife. Uh, Julia, intrigued by this idea of having that surgically corrected, approached Ulysses with the idea and she says, why Ulysses, what do you think? And Grant says, well Julia, you know if you had the surgery done, you wouldn't look like the same girl I met and fell in love with all those years ago. Seems kind of sappy, but at the same time Julia was so touched by this remark she decided not to have that surgery done after all, realizing that Grant thought she was beautiful just the way she was and she didn't have to change one thing about her appearance. But it was something she was very self-conscious about and pretty much for the rest of her life she would pose in profile so that you could only see one or uh, the other eye. Uh, this is also kind of an interesting picture because here we see Ulysses Grant again in his general's uniform, uh, but contrary to the picture we saw in the formal parlor, Grant is now wearing a lieutenant general's uniform Form. Uh, you can see if you look carefully the three-star shoulder strap uh, right here and uh, we may even have one of those three three-star shoulder straps in our museum we do at least have one of Grant's and it could be the very strap he's wearing in that picture for all we know but this picture would have been taken just about before uh, Ulysses Grant embarked on the overland campaign fighting Robert E Lee until the bitter end of that great American Civil War uh, so these are some of the family pictures do we have a question? Well, we've got a couple people who are asking about, you know, they understand that, you know, the public is not able to go upstairs. Right. But we do have some questions from people maybe wondering if maybe we can take a quick jump upstairs yeah. just to kind of show people an area that's not usually open to the public. Sure. If you so want to do a detour and just do that real quickly. Absolutely. So it's kind of a unique experience. Again, we don't give guided tours upstairs, mainly because this home is over 200 years old. Structurally, uh, it can't accommodate the weight of our visitors here on the second floor. And if you've noticed, the ceilings in these lower rooms are sagging today as a result of uh, that weight over time. Uh, the other thing that we have working against us are fire code restrictions. We're not really allowed to bring people up what is a very steep and narrow staircase. And you'll see as I carefully walk up the stairs just how steep and narrow it is, especially for a modern person. You can imagine how difficult it might have been to be Julia Dent, for instance, walking up this staircase uh, wearing a hoop dress or a hoop skirt like we saw in the formal parlor, or even more hazardous to walk down this staircase as uh, she did pretty much every day uh, um, here living, living on the farm, or contrary, what it might have been like to be an enslaved person carrying heavy buckets of water up here to the second floor so that the dents could bathe here in their bedrooms. Oftentimes, bathtubs were portable and would have been brought in to the bedrooms. And we are actually standing in the hallway. Um, I will point out before we head into the bedrooms, uh, this window right over here. Walking down hallway to window. So uh, in the 1990s, when the National Park Service was restoring this home, uh, we, uh, we started doing a lot of work that involved taking the house apart and piecing it back together the way it used to be, uh, called a restoration job. And uh, when they started working on this section of the home, one of the things that they were obligated to do was take this window out of its frame for structural repairs. 
As the workers removed this window from its frame, a scrap of paper came floating out of the window frame and down onto the ground. Uh, and uh, one of the guys working on the job picked up the paper and realizing it was old and probably important, handed over to handed it over to our uh, cultural resources staff at the time, who then identified the letter was actually written by none other than Ulysses S. Grant. And this is a letter that Grant would have written while being stationed away from the family. Um, he had just, uh, uh, well, he was expecting to hear about the birth of his second son, that boy we saw downstairs, Ulysses Jr., and he writes to Julia kind of frantically asking for some information about the birth of that child. He's really concerned about, you know, whether or not Julia is still well, if the child was born successfully, uh, what his name is, um, and it starts, Dearest Julia, and it continues asking her about the family. And that letter uh, was preserved, and today it's one of the, uh, the, the cornerstones of our park collections. And we do occasionally exhibit that item, but it's rare because that letter, after years of being inside the wall cavity, is very uh, Fragile, fragile, and uh, you know we're often asked how did the letter even get into the window frame as well. One of the stories I used to hear around here is that Julia um, uh, tucked it away for safekeeping in the window frame. I don't buy that. Um, what I do buy is that Julia likely stored that letter up in the attic. And before we show you the bedrooms, let's take a really quick trip up to the attic space, and uh, we're going to take a look at a room where that letter may have been stored before it was found in the wall cavity. Walking upstairs into an unfinished attic space with exposed wood rafters, limestone chimney stacks, and large steel I-beams. Okay, so here we are in the attic space of the home. This was primarily used for storage, although there was some archaeological evidence that suggested this may have been used as sleeping quarters from time to time for the enslaved African Americans who worked here in the household. Uh, so what happened with this letter? Well, it's possible, it seems plausible that Julia would have tucked that letter away for safekeeping up here in the attic, probably in a, in a crate, and at some point during their stay at Whitehaven, a mouse or a rodent got into that crate and uh, ultimately pulled that letter out and down into the wall cavities where it was found nearly 140 years later by the National Park Service. So you can imagine how this room would have been filled with storage and uh, pieces do get you know, taken by rodents uh, to use as nesting and that's likely how that letter made its way into the wall cavity to begin with. Uh, this is kind of a unique space, both in the sense that it was storage and also possibly living quarters. It also gives us a unique view of the property, which Nick just pointed out from this window. kind of shows us uh, the view that maybe enslaved African Americans would have seen as they were preparing for the day had they lived in this room. One of the other unique features that we'll see in this space is a, uh, a structural um, accommodation. And so when the National Park Service began their work here at Whitehaven, the structure of the home was actually in pretty bad shape. Uh, the house itself was falling in on itself, being pushed in from both sides by the weight of the heavy stone chimneys. Uh, this had caused the floors on the second floor of the house where the bedrooms are to buckle. And uh, as a result, those floors were getting ready to collapse about the time the National Park Service took over. Um, for weeks at a time, the National Park Service actually worked round the clock to stabilize this house and build modern foundations to support what was a sagging home. And as part of that project, they also ran uh, a rebar the length of the main house and uh, tried to kind of pull this entire place into square using this I-beam structure which was installed here in the attic of the home. So this is something the public doesn't usually get to see, uh, but it is part of the uh, structural engineering that goes into keeping this historic home stable and safe for our visitors today. So kind of a unique view of what this space looks like upstairs uh, here in the attic. Now we're going to head back down to the bedrooms and I'll kind of show you where the uh, Dents and the Grants may have slept during their time here at Whitehaven. So we're going to make our way again down a very steep staircase here. Walking downstairs and through a hallway with white plaster walls and beige colored woodwork. And uh, we're actually going to start right over here in this bedroom. Walking into an unfurnished bedroom, steel rods drop from ceiling to floor. Uh, looking at, uh, you know, basically where that rebar is going. So we saw the frame upstairs, it's kind of holding this house 
uh, level. Uh, this is the rebar that passes from the I-beam system. It's actually connected to the ceiling of the formal parlor where we first walked in today. And it's basically pulling this floor up into level. Um, it is still not perfectly level, uh, but it is structurally sound enough for us to walk around up here um, and uh, clean and open windows, especially in the summertime when it's too hot to leave these windows closed. But we can see this was a bedroom space at one time. Uh, every bedroom in the house had its own fireplace, and there are actually two bedrooms total here at Whitehaven. We know from descriptions of life here during Julia's childhood that in one room across the hall, Julia's parents had their own space. They had their own bedroom, which was a sign of wealth. Many families, they would share a room with their children. Abraham Lincoln, for instance, grew up in a house where everybody not only shared the same room, which was a bedroom, living room, kitchen, and living space, but it was, uh, he also grew up in a house where they all shared one bed. And to have two separate bedrooms for such a large family might not seem like such a big deal today, but at the time, having two rooms would have been a great sign of wealth. So this would have at one time been the children's bedroom, we believe, it is the larger of the two rooms. Julia describes sharing this space with her seven brothers and sisters, uh, whom she grew up here with uh, at Whitehaven. And uh, in the summertime, when it was too hot to sleep in beds together because they would sleep two or three kids to a bed, oftentimes they would pull their pillows and blankets out onto the second floor porch, where we'll walk here in just a moment. And uh, this is where they could cool off and air out a little bit in the summertime. You can also imagine how smelly some of these kids might have been, considering Victorians only bathe maybe once a month at that point in history. So the porch gave them a place in the summertime to air out and uh, really stay a lot cooler than they might have here in the upper floor of the main house. And we're gonna take a quick walk just across the, uh, the hallway here. And uh, we're gonna step right into uh, Grant's uh, 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 parents, or Julia's parents' room, I should say. So this is likely where Mr. and Mrs. Den would have had their bed. Again, they have their own fireplace in here. Uh, some uh, people who would walk up here, uh, uh, contractors and maintenance folks will ask, what these uh, lines are here on the floor. These are actually part of our fiber optic light system, uh, which you don't really see. They're hidden away on the front door, but, or uh, uh, first floor, uh, but they do help provide extra light for our visitors, especially on a day like today when it's really overcast outside. But this is pretty much what the bedrooms look like. As you can see, they're empty, devoid of any kind of furnishings. Uh, there aren't any plans in the works to bring tours up here in the future. Requiring uh, an extra staircase or two would really do a lot of of, uh, damage to the historic appeal, appeal of the house and the structure itself. So right now we don't have any plans to bring tours up here, but we're happy to share the space with you via this Facebook Live video. And before we head back to the first floor, I'm going to take you all out to uh, what is probably my favorite place on the property. Uh, this is a place that Julia referred to as the Piazza, uh, which was basically fancy speak for the front porch uh, where they spent a lot of their time hanging out. I talked about the dents and the grants sleeping out in this space. Um, you can imagine uh, the uh, pillows and blankets kind of lined up here on the porch. On another day, you might have a chair or two set out here and you could read, you know, using the sunlight because they didn't have electric lights in the hall. This would have been a great place to catch the breeze in the summertime and just enjoy nature. And as Nick pans around, you'll actually see today it's still a nice view. We do see a lot of suburban homes beyond us. We also see things like this beautiful magnolia tree, which is just beginning uh, to, uh, to bud uh, in preparation for the spring springtime bloom here on the property. And if you ever get a chance to visit Whitehaven in the mid-spring, you'll see this tree in full bloom, uh, dropping petals, and uh, the ground out here looks kind of like a sea of uh, 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 magenta colored and white colored uh, petals. So it's very pretty property, one of my favorite uh, perspectives of the estate. And uh, you can also see if you step over here uh, what the roofing looks like on the main house. Um, what we do here is we do restore the home as accurately as possible to its 1875 appearance. And at that point in time, the house would have had a cedar shingle roofing. And so when you look at the roof here, this is actually wood sheeting or wood shingling, I should say. And if you look at the cap there, where one shingle overlaps the next. What we're looking at is a type of cap they would have called a feather cap. So a lot of visitors ask about that. Uh, that's what they called a feather cap, and that would have been a traditional style of roofing uh, back when this addition was made in about 1830. So we're going to make our way back down to the first floor of the house, um, and uh, we're going to look at some of the other rooms uh, that are attached to the back of the home today. So again, we're going to make our way down the steep staircase here. things visitors 
customers often notice is that on these treads, you can actually see wear marks from people who have walked over these steps for the last 200 years. And it's true that the Grants and the Dents were not the only people to live in this home. Uh, for nearly 75 years after the Dents and the Grants, uh, there was a family named Wenslick who lived in this house. They walked up and down these stairs every day. So for nearly 200 years, people have been leaving their mark literally on these steps. And today you can see that uh, when you visit the home and look up the staircase here towards the bedrooms. We'll make our way back uh, up into the sitting room. And then we're going to take a long step down uh, into a, a modern addition to the home. So this house, when it was originally constructed, only came with four rooms. The first two rooms, the parlor and the dining room, were the main floor. The second floor would have been those two bedrooms, and then you had a porch, uh, what Julia called the piazza. Uh, so about 1830 or so, uh, Julia's father, he looks at his family, it's growing larger, he decides he's going to move out to Whitehaven full time, and his family's going to need a little bit more room to grow. About that same time, Dent hires, we suppose, uh, a 19th century version of a contractor who comes out here and builds an addition onto his house. Uh, there were some rumors that this home, or this building, uh, this room I should say, was a pre-existing cabin. Based on dental chronology, we don't believe that to be the case anymore. Uh, we think that this addition was built brand new here on the property and uh, was attached to the main house, uh, giving the family a lot more space to grow and, uh, and live. Um, so at one time, this would have been the back of the home. This would have been an exterior door, as was the enslaved entrance that I pointed out as we walked from the dining room into this space. And what you would have seen right out here was an open porch covered by an overhang. Somewhere around 1868, shortly around, uh, uh, somewhere around the time that Grant was elected president, he decides to make some changes to this home. And we know that post-Civil War, Grant purchases this property from his in-laws. He makes his plans to come back and retire here before being elected. But he doesn't let the election get in the way, the fact that he wants to fix this place up. And one of Grant's additions to the home is going to become a modern kitchen, quote unquote modern kitchen. Uh, according to uh, some records we have, Grant personally designed this room himself. So we're going to take a quick step down into this so-called modern kitchen, take a look at what this may have been like at one time. You can see there's not a whole lot to it. Um, kitchens in those days didn't, you know, uh, uh, really uh, uh, look much like kitchens today. There weren't a lot of appliances in kitchens at the time. One new appliance at the time would have been something like this cast iron stove. Cast iron stoves were invented really in the 1840s and 50s and really became popular cooking implements in the 1860s and 70s. And at this time, most homes in the area would have been using large open fireplaces to cook meals. Uh, but here at Whitehaven, Grant does install what is a modern stove. In St. Louis, it's a perfect place to buy a stove because we actually had more stove manufacturers here anywhere else in the country. And so this is a perfect place if you're a homeowner to buy your very first cast iron appliance. And many people comment how short the stove was. Um, just remember, people were a lot shorter in those days. And this was also apparently a laundry model. Um, there's actually a ring on the other side you can't see. That was for a laundry mangle attachment. And you could put your wash tub right here on top and wash your clothes, which might suggest another reason why this is so low to the ground. But traditionally, stoves, they start out pretty small and get larger as time goes by. Uh, for an idea of what the rest of this room might have looked like, Nick, if you can pan over here, we'll take a look at this, uh, this image here on the wall. This is kind of a 19th century, typical late 19th century kitchen here in this drawing. Uh, we can see things like the stove that's here in the room. Uh, we also see things that you won't see in this room today, like a work table and a dish rack, a spice cabinet, um, kitchen implements and tools hanging from the walls. That's the kind of stuff you would have seen in this space at one time. What you didn't see in this room are things like the sink over here in the corner. That might resemble what a lot of us have in our homes today. Here at Whitehaven, there was no indoor plumbing until well into the 20th century. Uh, but uh, um, some city homes did have sinks. Uh, but here at Whitehaven, uh, they would have had a cistern. And we'll show you that cistern, uh, which is just outside the window here in just a moment. The other thing you may have noticed in this picture was a large cabinet up against the wall. That's an ice box. And you know, in the city, a lot of times, 
blocks of ice were delivered on a daily basis. I know my grandmother called the refrigerator the ice box because when she was growing up, literally you put a block of ice in the top of this cabinet, the cold air would fall down and help to keep your food cool, like a modern refrigerator without the electric motor. Uh, but uh, here at Whitehaven, uh, they had way too much produce being grown here on the farm to have a simple ice box. Instead, here on the farm, they had an ice house. And we're going to be looking at that here in just a few minutes. And before we leave this room, I just wanted to point out uh, one very important feature, and that is the vertical log construction of the room next door to us. So I mentioned that about 1830, Den hires somebody to build a log cabin onto the side of his house. What's unique about this cabin is that it's made of vertical logs. And at a time when most homes are being made out of horizontal logs, which is what most of us expect, for a home of this age, uh, there are still builders in the St. Louis area constructing cabins out of what was really a French colonial era uh, style of architecture. Uh, French, early French settlers to this country built many of their original structures out of vertical logs. And given St. Louis's early connection to French culture, it means that most of the city at one time was built out of vertical logs just like you see here. Uh, many of those structures existed well up until 1849. That year, a steamship boiler blew up on the riverfront. A fire spread from one ship to the next, and it happened to be an especially windy day. And before you know it, this fire had spread from the riverfront into the city, catching buildings made of vertical logs, which are dry from the summer heat on fire. And uh, at this point, many blocks of the city of St. Louis would burn uh, to the ground. And after this, St. Louis actually passes an ordinance that says from this date forward, all buildings within a certain square uh, radius of the river have to be made of brick or stone. So if anybody is from the St. Louis area watching this today, as you drive around downtown, downtown St. Louis, especially near the riverfront, so one of the reasons we see so many brick structures and stone structures today, uh, like the old Rock House, which is now preserved in the Gateway Arch Museum, uh, one of our neighboring NPS sites here in St. Louis. But you can see here, uh, they didn't leave the, uh, the logs there, as would have been the, the standard in a lot of uh, poorer family homes. Uh, instead, here in the Dent household, they paid the extra money to have this wall plastered over. And you can see how the first step was nailing up lath. These are basically strips of wood to hold the plaster in place. Then, of course, they're going to put on a rough layer of plaster, a base coat, if you were, or as it were. And then right here, uh, we have kind of a uh, semi-finish. And then, of course, you get that nice uh, clean finish on top. It ends up looking a lot like drywall today, uh, but it's a lot more difficult to achieve. This would have been another great sign of wealth um, uh, being shown off here at the Den household. Um, and you can see here also we've got a toolbox kind of showing us what a carpenter's tools might look like as they're working on a lath and plaster wall like the one you see next to us here. Walking into a small room with bright green clapboards heading on one side, a layer of dirt dulls the paint. A dark green beadboard door hangs at the center of the wall. Okay, so uh, I'm going to finish up in this room and then I'll pass it back to Nick to take care of some of the other outbuildings and I'll be back with you here in just a moment. But uh, before we leave the main house, um, I wouldn't want to miss this wall. This is one of the most interesting sections of the home. To folks who are interested in the architecture and the history of the structure itself. Um, we can see from this side uh, another angle of the enslaved entrance for the home. Uh, the only thing that's not original on this wall is the porcelain knob, which is a, a replacement put here by the National Park Service. The original knob is in our collections, but everything else that you see on this wall is exactly as we found it. And as the story goes, somewhere in the 19, uh, 19, early 1900s, all of this was plastered over as well. If you look carefully, you can kind of see the diagonal plaster marks here on the wall as the lath was nailed up diagonally and then the plaster had seeped through underneath. Um, and uh, when the Park Service took over, all of this was still plastered. And uh, the space that we're standing in right now is actually a modern kitchen constructed in the 1960s or early 70s. And so this space was full of appliances. They had uh, a refrigerator and a stove right here. The family who had been living here for the last three generations didn't know this wall existed. They didn't know this door existed. But when the National Park Service started working on the house, around the same time they discovered the letter upstairs, they also removed this plaster wall. Uh, and in the process of trying to get rid of things like asbestos insulation installed later during the 20th century, they also made this discovery, the original Paris green paint. 
And uh, not only did they find the original paint job still preserved underneath that plaster wall, but they also found um, through paint analysis uh, several chips or a chip that they could use um, for, um, uh, for paint analysis so they could actually figure out what layers were underneath the original Paris green. And they discovered that the house called Whitehaven was never actually white. Uh, it was originally painted kind of a beige color, then it was painted uh, a gray color with black trim, and finally when Ulysses S. Grant was owner of this property, Paris green was chosen as the uh, primary color for the main house. And here you can see how the park service has just taken a dry paintbrush and just kind of brushed some of that dirt away so you can see the Paris green underneath. So not only was this a discovery of the original slave entrance to the home, we also found that original paint here uh, in about 1994. Okay, so we're running a little short on time, so I think do we have time just for maybe one or two more rooms real quickly, and then we will uh, we'll wrap up the tour here. So, um, uh, but yes, the original Paris green color right there from 1874. Did uh, the uh, did you talk about that a little bit there? You mentioned the, I did. Uh, the Paris green. Cool. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna do two more rooms and then wrap up our tour here. Um, we're going to head into the office space here, and probably wise as we're making our way in here, I'm going to do a little dab of hand sanitizer as we come in here. So the office space, um, the original office was added to Whitehaven uh, in 1818. So I mentioned that the house was originally built between 1812 and 1816. A couple years later, the office is going to be added to the house. Uh, there was a family that lived in Whitehaven until 1986. There were seven, uh, six different owners after Ulysses Grant died who uh, lived and owned Whitehaven. And this room was turned into a sunroom. So the park service, when we took over, we rebuilt the office space. This is also a nice hangout for us during tours because there's central heating and air in this room today for our comfort. But uh, a couple things I'll mention here on the desk. Uh, Grant himself. He would have written letters to uh, family members back in his native Ohio. Uh, the letter here, this is a copy of a letter that Ulysses wrote to his father in 1856. And Grant in this letter, he, so he would have had a, a wood pen. He dip his pen in ink, write the letter out, and if he got too much ink on the paper, he could use what's called an ink blotter, which is this device right here. So you grab that ink blotter and you smooth it over the paper to get rid of any extra ink that might be on your paper. But this particular letter, Grant talked about some of the crops that he was raising here, primarily fruits and vegetables like potatoes, uh, wheat, oats, grains, apples, stuff like that. And uh, Grant would be keeping track of his money, reading books, and I guess I better mention the smoking pipe here too. Uh, Grant, when he lived at Whitehaven, he would occasionally smoke a tobacco pipe, but he's not really going to pick up that cigar smoking habit until during the Civil War. Uh, long story short, uh, a fellow commander gives him a cigar, Grant decides he's going to start smoking it, and he, uh, and years after the war, he's known to smoke up to 20 cigars a day. So, kids, if you're watching, don't smoke, it's not good for you, it's harmful. <laughs> But, uh, but we do have that uh, tobacco pipe there. I want to mention one more thing in this office here, and this is a map of St. Louis from 1878. So this is a property map of different people who were living here in the area. Uh, Grant left the White House in 1877. So the Grants have left the White House when this map is made, but Ulysses and Julia bought Whitehaven from the dead family after the war, and they had ownership up until Grant dies in 1885. So almost 20 years the Grants actually owned the White Haven property, although they weren't living here after the war. And in the middle of the map, we can see the White Haven property, the 850 acres. Um, so it's sort of like a J shape. I say it kind of looks like the state of Indiana. And uh, we're standing at the black dot there. Uh, Grant's farm are friends across the street, the Anheuser Bush property across the street. Uh, a lot of folks take Gravoy Road to visit the park today, and that is on this map from 1878. And um, uh, Grant himself was working farmland north of Whitehaven. It's a residential neighborhood, and there's a cemetery up here today. But um, Grant built his log cabin hard scrabble here, and he was farming this part of the property when he lived here in the 1850s. One more thing I'll mention, Don Carlos Buell, this guy here, he's got about 40 acres just a little bit east of the Whitehaven property. 
He was also a Civil War general fly for the Union, and uh, Grant fired him after the Battle of Shiloh in 1862. And uh, Buell is buried in St. Louis. I believe he's in uh, Calvary Cemetery, the Catholic Cemetery uh, in uh, St. Louis. Why don't we go ahead, we're gonna show you one more room. We're gonna show you the basement. We're gonna save the outbuildings for another time. But we're gonna go into the basement as I wanna show you the winter kitchen of Whitehaven and we'll wrap up that. So if you wanna follow me, Ranger closes his door and walks down a short set of wooden steps and across a white flagstone sidewalk. A nickel-plated hand pump with a black handle sits atop a stone cistern tank. So as we walk into the basement, one of the things you'll notice is the cistern here. So they would have used this to pump water collected from their rain gutters on the home. And uh, this was the primary water source for the main house. There was also a secondary water source at a spring house out beyond us and past those red outbuildings. Walking downstairs into a basement with limestone walls, exhibit cases, and a ceiling made of hardwood timbers. A fireplace on the right is surrounded by pots and pans and a table sits in the center of the room. Okay, so uh, we are in the winter kitchen of White. Haven. So a lot of plantation homes in the deep south. Uh, we know about summer kitchens and slave laborers cooking outside to keep the heat away from the home, but less often do you see a winter kitchen. But uh, here in St. Louis, it gets cold enough that uh, you'd want to be cooking in the house to provide a little bit extra heat, and that's what the, uh, the role of the winter kitchen was at the time. So if you kind of pan around the room here, uh, you immediately notice it's a lot darker in here compared to the rest of the house. There's only one window bringing in light. It could get very uh, hot down here if you're cooking in this hot fire. Um, Julia Grant recalled that the enslaved laborers actually specialized in making seafood dishes. Uh, the dents would actually import seafood, bring it in, and uh, Julia recalled that Mary Robinson, one of the enslaved laborers here, she actually specialized in making crab cakes. So kind of a uh, highlight of the dense wealth. And of course, as I mentioned, the dents originally came from Maryland and a lot of these enslaved laborers came from Maryland and Virginia. So they're gonna be prepping a lot of food in this winter kitchen. When they're done cooking, they go up through the little side door around the corner here, and then they would go around the back into the slave's door uh, to get back into the main house. So quite a trek with the food to go out the side door, up back around through the slave's door. One thing I'll mention, hopefully we can get good lighting in here. If we look up at the ceiling, these rafters, these rafters are made of oak and they are original. They date back to the 1830s. So these oak rafters, about 190 years old, and these were here in the days of slavery here at Whitehaven. And I should add that uh, the enslaved laborers here during the Civil War um, there were still, according to the 1860 census, there were seven enslaved African Americans still at Whitehaven when the Civil War broke out. But during the war, the enslaved laborers ran away from Whitehaven. So they basically voted for freedom with their feet, trying to find a better life for themselves and freedom after the Civil War. To wrap up here, I just want to mention the room next to us. This is a room that the Park Service built. So at the time, this would have been one continuous wall for the winter kitchen. But we've done archeology span here at the property, particularly in the 1990s, there are several archeological projects that were done. And uh, we found upwards of 2000 different types of historical artifacts doing archeology, span digging to the ground, trying to find stuff. So these are all things that were found doing archeology. span So some broken china dishes, there's um, silverware, there's crockery uh, type of, types of things. That's a pig's jaw, it's not a human jaw, don't worry. And then there's also some toys that we found as well, some of which the enslaved children may have been playing with as well. So there's animal bones there. And then over here you'll see there's marbles, there's a base, there's a base of a hair comb, uh, there's some slate pencils as well. So it's really cool. Oh, and there's this glass bead here, this red glass bead. Um, kind of interesting because uh, it's believed this came from West Africa. So the enslaved laborers here, um, their religious practices were probably a blending of Christianity and West African religious traditions uh, that they brought with them here when they were uh, living here in Whitehaven in the years before the Civil War. So, um, yes, last thing I'll mention here for this room, a couple of years ago, we wanted to make a video kind of depicting the enslaved laborers and what they may have been going through, what they may have been thinking about during the Civil War. Um, was it worth it to run away? 
What are some of the challenges of running away? You could be captured. You could be sold back into slavery. You could be whipped. You could be sold downriver to a new place that you'd never been to before. So uh, a couple of years ago, Park Service worked with our local PBS affiliate, KTC Channel 9, and we produced a, uh, a four-minute film kind of showing the enslaved laborers and some of the things that they would have been going through, one of the things they would have been thinking about during the Civil War. Um, I think we're running short on time, but when you come here and visit with us in person, watch this film. It's very, very powerful. So, um, David, is there any anything you want to add as we kind of wrap up the tour here? Maybe we can go back outside and see if we have any questions from uh, anybody who's watching. Sure. Well, I think folks are just telling us uh, it's actually pouring down rain out here right now, but folks are just responding that they enjoyed the tour today. And uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, if you guys enjoyed today's tour, we will consider doing more virtual tours in Absolutely. the future. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we wanted to thank you guys for tuning in today. I also wanted to mention that the uh, video that Nick just mentioned uh, that we normally show down in the Winter Kitchen, that is available on our website at nps.gov slash ULSG. And you can watch that at home if you want to, or you can certainly come and watch it right here at the Grant Historic Site. Uh, so I think that's it for me. Nick, did you have anything? No, thank you all for participating and watching. We'll definitely uh, keep in mind doing more virtual tours like this in the future. And we really just hope that everybody stays safe. Um, stay home, take care of yourselves and your families. And uh, we really appreciate your continued support. And if you've not been here before, we hope to see you in the future. If you've been here before, come back. Thank you.